We're looking this morning at the scripture, Joshua chapter number two. The title of the message this morning is A Rope of Hope. A Rope of Hope. Let's read several verses, starting with verse number one. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there come men in hither tonight of the country of the children to, of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thy house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate when it was dark that the men went out. Whether the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and had hid them with stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way of Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they were pursued after them, were gone out, they shut the gate. And when they were laid down, she came up to them upon the roof and said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, which were on the other side, Jordan, Shihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now, therefore, I pray you, swearing to me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness unto my father's house. I'm having a difficult time reading. Verse 12. Now, therefore, I pray you, swearing to me by the Lord, since I showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness in my father's house and give me a true token and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all they, all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, our life for yours. If you utter not this, our business, and it shall be that the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window of her house, which was upon the town wall. And she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you out to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide themselves, and hide yourselves there three days, until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may you go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's house home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quiet of thine oath which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, According to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. Now, Lord, I can't recall a time when I've ever read so poorly the Scripture. God, that indicates to me that it may be a difficult time for me this morning, and that I need to get out of the way and let you have this spot. And so, Father, the best I know how, I yield again to you this morning. Lord, I pray for every person that's here, that they would hear the Word of God, that they would understand the Word of God, that they would respond to the Word of God. And if Satan be in our midst, I pray that you drive him out of this place. Father, our desire is to bring honor and glory to you this day. We're going to trust you to do great and mighty things, not because we're good, not because we're intelligent, not because we're capable, but because you are our God. Accomplish your will and your work this hour, and we'll give you the praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen. The title of the message is, A Rope of Hope. A Rope of Hope. 
There's a lot of big things taking place in this Bible passage and around this Bible passage. It was a great time in Israel's history. But I don't want to look at the big picture today. Actually, I want to look at the very small picture, the smallest of pictures in this entire story. Let's make sure we do understand, though, the bigger picture. Three major things are taking place right now. Number one, as we're reading this text, Israel is coming into the promised land. Now, they had been promised that land some 600 years before. There's 600 years that pass from the time that God makes the first promise to Abraham that he can have the land until they're actually coming into the land under the hand of Joshua. 400 of those 600 years, Israel will actually be slaves in the land of Egypt under the oppression of the pharaohs. So this is a big event. During this time, Israel is finally receiving the promise that God made to them all of those years before. First big thing, Israel is coming in the land. Second big thing, Moses, God's servant, had died. Now Moses was not a man of God. Moses was the man of God. Moses was nothing more than a little shepherd when God put his hand upon him and called him to go back to Pharaoh and to lead the children of Israel out. You have to understand that Egypt at that time had to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, world power that existed. And God called one man and filled that one man with his power. And that one man alone, with the power of God, brought that mighty nation of Egypt to its knees. That one man, with his miracles, with the power of God working through him, humiliated Pharaoh and humbled the armies and the people of the land of Israel. But the Bible tells us, as the book of Joshua starts, that Moses, my servant, is dead. Now we've got a younger man. His name is Joshua. Now Joshua's not young by any stretch of the means. He's been with Moses since the Exodus began over 40 years ago. And he was probably with Moses even before that. Probably with Moses as soon as Moses came back into the land to demand that Pharaoh let the people go. But his name isn't mentioned until the exodus begins to take place. During all that time, Joshua has been a loyal, faithful friend and fellow servant to Moses. But now, he's not just the second in command, he's the general of all. And now Israel's not just marching in the wilderness for 40 years. Now they're crossing the River Jordan and they're going into the Promised Land where immediately they will have to fight to take that land. This man Joshua, he's a good man. This man Joshua, he's a faithful man. This man Joshua, he's a godly man. But so far, this man Joshua has not been tried. He's not been tested. Now we're about to see what kind of man... Joshua is. This is a big event. It's big because Israel's coming into the land. It's big because Moses has died. It's big because Jericho is the first city they have to take. Now you need to understand, Jericho was the big city. In the last 600 years since God promised the nation of Israel this land, many things have changed. Israel went from a small population. It started out just two people. When God first called Abraham to be a Jew, to be his people, it was just Abraham and his wife Sarai. Well, now they number over three million people. Also, during these 600 years, the inhabitants of this land has grown in population as well. They've begun to fortify their cities. Many of their cities now have walls around them. They literally are forts. However, as far as we can discern from archaeology, there was no city more heavily fortified and better protect, protected than the city of Jericho. Archaeologists tell us that this city, as was common in the day, was built on a hill or a mound. In Israel, they call them tails, T-E-L-L. -L. So it would be lifted up high, not just eyeball high, not just 20 feet high, but many feet high. It would be built on a hill or on a mountain. 
Archaeologists said at the base of the tell of Jericho, there was a retaining wall that went all the way around the mountain to hold the foundation firm. And on top of that foundation wall was another wall built. It went up together with the retaining wall between 30 and 40 feet. 30 and 40 feet. It was approximately 6 feet thick. Pretty sound wall to begin your fortifications. But then as you go up higher on the tail, some distance up, you come to the second wall. The second wall built like the first wall, only it went up as far as 45 feet in the air. So that even as you are in the plain, getting close to the city of Jericho, from a far distance, you would be able to see these two huge walls that literally stretched dozens of feet up into the sky, sound, solid rock, six feet thick. And you begin to understand that the only way the nation of Israel is going to defeat the city of Jericho is if God shows up. And if God shows up with a big miracle. I'm simply pointing out, as you read this story, there's a big picture here. And what we're going to talk about this morning is just a small element inside this big picture. What I want to talk to you about this morning is the rope. The Bible mentions a rope three different times. It's mentioned in verse 15. It's mentioned again in verse 18. It's mentioned a third time in verse number 21. Each time that it's mentioned, it's actually a different Hebrew word used for the rope. You can't tell that in our Bible. However, even in our Bible, they do call it by different names. In verse number 15, it's called a cord. In verse number 18, it's called a line of scarlet thread. In verse number 21, I believe it's called a scarlet line. So it's mentioned by three different words. I believe there's a lesson we can learn by something as small as the rope the rope that I'm calling the rope of hope. Let me make one thought before we actually get into the heart of the message here. I know there's big things going on all the time. You can't listen to the news anymore without hearing all the big things. We've got president over in Russia, or president having problems with Russia. They're over, he's over in Saudi Arabia, and he's signing arrangements over there. Most people don't even know what he's signing. And you look around in the world, there's so many big things going on. I want you to understand something about our God. There may be big things going on all the time around us, but God's got his eyes on the little people. Never forget this God that we worship has his eyes on the little people. He's got his eyes on you. This morning, for a few moments, let's talk about the rope of hope. If you go back and look at verse number 15, you'll see the word that's mentioned there. It's just the simple word. Four letters in our English language is the word cord. Now, I've already mentioned that all three of the words that are used for this rope are different in the Hebrew. The word that's used in the Hebrew actually has four different meanings. In our English language, we call that, I believe the right way to say it is a homonym. We call it a homonym. A homonym is when you have a word that sounds the same and can even be spelled the same, but it has different meanings. We have lots of those in our English language. A word with multiple meanings. For example, the word bear. B-E-A-R. When I say the word bear, most of you are probably going to think about the animal. There's an animal that we call a bear. However, the word also means to expose. It means to show all. So the only way you can know what the word bear means is to study the context, the way it's used. And as you study the context, you can figure out which of the two meanings is appropriate for the word bear. Another homonym is the word pool. This time of the year, most of us got pools on our mind. A pool is an artificial body of water. You can dig a hole and fill it full, call that a pool. You can build it up on top of the land surface, put water inside of it. That's called a pool. But it's also a game you can play. You can get a bunch of billiard ball balls and a couple of sticks, and you can start slapping those balls around that table, and that's called pool. The only way you'll know what word we're actually talking about is to look at the context to see how that word is being used. That's called a homonym. You get language here for free. I don't charge anything else for that. All right? This word 
has four different meanings in the Hebrew. In our language, it's just a cord. But in the Hebrew language, it has four different meanings. Let me give you the four meanings that it has. The first meaning that it has is just like it's used in our text. It's a rope. It's a cord. It's a line. It's something that you might would take before chains came along and you might rope a steer or you might rope an animal and drag that animal wherever you want it to go. That's obviously one of the words for that word. That's how it's used in our text right here. It also can mean to tie together or to bind something together. Well, that kind of makes sense. That kind of goes together. It's a rope. What do you do with a rope? Well, you bind things together. So it could either be a noun or it could be a verb. It could be a rope that you bind things with or it could be the action of actually binding these two things together. The third one is quite different. The third definition is it means sorrow. It means to have grief. As a matter of fact, it's used quite often in our Bible that way. I won't read the context to you, but write down these verse references in the side. 2 Samuel 22.6 Isaiah 13, 8. Jeremiah 13, 21. Those three Bible passages, you'll see the word sorrow in the Bible passage. It's the same word that Joshua uses to describe rope. It means sorrow, grief, heartache, heartbreak. Fourth word that this can mean, or the fourth definition it can have is destruction. Destruction. The word that's used here for rope can mean destruction. Now you say, preacher, why in the world are you telling us this? I think God very carefully selects the words that he used in the text. I've already mentioned there's three different words for the word rope. He never used the same word twice. The first word that he uses is the word for a rope, but it also means sorrow. It means destruction. As we go through this message, you're going to figure something out. I think this rope is a picture, a symbol that describes Rahab's life. Now, we've not talked very much about Rahab. We don't know much about Rahab's life because the Bible doesn't tell us very much about her life. About the only thing that the Bible tells us about her life is her occupation. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've heard people talk about Rahab. And almost every time the name Rahab is mentioned her profession is always mentioned with it. It's very rare for anybody just to say the word, the name Rahab. They automatically say Rahab and they put her profession with it. Now her profession was a tough profession. But I'll tell you this, there's more to Rahab than just her profession. For example, the Bible actually tells us some of the things that she did. We're reading a story right now about Rahab and she helps the Jewish spies. She aids them. She actually helps them to escape. But when people mention the name Rehab, they don't ever say, Rehab, the woman who helped the spies escape. They never say that. Nobody ever says that. She became a Jew. She's actually in the process in this particular story of turning her back on the Amorites, on the people of Jericho, and converting to Judaism. Some might look at this and say, she betrayed her people, but I want you to get this now. Any Christian, any Christian who's a real Christian must likewise turn his or her back on this world and their alliances to this world in order to become a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, it may well be that we're never faced with such an extreme opportunity or choice that Rahab had to make but she just did what God commands every believer to do. To follow after God with all of their heart, with all of their mind, and with all of their soul. So yes, she did turn her back on her people, but she did that because she turned her face toward Jehovah God. That's the same thing all of us are supposed to do. Yet nobody, when they mention Rahab, nobody ever says, Rahab, the woman who converted to Judaism. Nobody ever describes it that way. She'll go on. Matthew chapter 1 verses 5 and 6 will mention her name in Jesus' genealogy. She will actually become a Jewess. She will marry a man whose name is Salmon. She will become the great, great grandmother of King David. She will become the great, great grandmother. Of... That's awesome. 
She's a Moabitess. She's living in the city of Jericho. She chooses God as her Savior. She turns her back on her own people. She becomes a Jew. And God so honors this woman with her profession still intact so that he puts her into the line of Jesus Christ. But nobody ever mentions Rahab's name and says, Rahab, the ancestor of Jesus Christ. You know what they always call her? Rahab the harlot. I don't know much about harlotry. I don't know much about that lifestyle. But I think that for a person to become a harlot, they would have to have a life with much sorrow in it. Remember one of the definitions of the word rope? It can be a line, it can be a cord. It can be something you bind together, but the third definition is sorrow. I can't imagine anybody ever getting to the place where they sold their body who did not have much sorrow. I'll promise you something else about Rahab. Not only did sorrow bring her to her profession, but her profession continued to bring her back to sorrow. There's no way you could have that kind of a job and not have grief and hurt and sorrow in your life every single day. I think God picked that word rope out on many words he could have used. There's three in this text, but I think he picked that word out because one of the meanings of that word cord is sorrow. And this woman had a lot of sorrow in her life. Fourth meaning is the word destruction. More true now than ever before, that kind of a promiscuous lifestyle brings destruction. We have so many venereal diseases today that it's not even funny. It's sad. It is really sad. But I want you to know something. We've always had them. You know, on the old westerns, they always go into the saloon and there's always madams inside the saloon. They always have them painted up so nice and glamorous and beautiful. Yeah. Oh, Kitty Russell, if you, if you remember Gunsmoke, uh, she played that part for oh, 18 years or something like that on Gunsmoke, but she was a madam. I got news for you folks. You don't stay that fresh and clean and crisp being a madam for 18 or 20 years. No, there's diseases that come. There's sorrow that comes. Remember the fourth word, fourth definition of that word? Destruction. You know what that kind of a lifestyle brings? It brings destruction. By the way, it's not just harlotry that brings such sorrow and destruction, all sin brings sorrow and destruction. But the Bible says of Rahab that somewhere in her house, she found a cord, a rope. The the word the Bible selected to describe it wasn't just a rope, it was a word that also meant sorrow and destruction. Why? Because inside that dear lady's house was also much sorrow and there was much destruction. There was a cord there. And that cord was symbolic of her life. It was a cord of sorrow and destruction. Second word is found down in verse number 18. There, the phrase that's used is a line of scarlet thread. Thread is the word that I draw your attention to. It's used some six, seven times in our Bible. Four of the times that it's used, it's actually translated the word thread. Literally, a thread. You know what a thread is, ladies. You sew with a thread. A thread is a single strand of cloth. Now, if you read this whole story, this whole account, which we more or less tried to do a minute ago, you'll find out that what Rahab is going to do is she's going to take this cord, what's being called now a thread, she's going to let it out the window. Her house was on this tall 45-foot wall. She had a back window that looked out over this wall. She's going to let that rope, that cord, that thread down, and two grown men are going to skimmy 45 feet down that cord to the ground. Friend, I don't know of a thread in the world that's strong enough to hold two grown men where they can skim me down. The Bible is picking a word that, yes, it can mean a rope or a cord, but its primary use is thread. Why did God pick the word thread to describe what is obviously much more than a thread? I think God, by using that word, And the color he associates with it was trying to tell us that this rope was not the kind of a rope you would work with. For example, think about the color. It's been dyed. 
It's been dyed red. Now, we got all kinds of coloring today. But even in my lifetime, until recently, I rarely saw colored rope. The only colored rope you would ever see is maybe if it was at the marina. Maybe it would be a yellow rope so it would stick out a little bit more in the water. But primarily, rope would be a tan color. It's natural color. Or perhaps it would have been bleached to white. But most people until recently never colored a work rope, especially in that day. Because coloring in that day was quite rare. It was very expensive. Who's going to color, dye a rope red, then go out and lasso a calf? Who's going to dye a rope red, then go out and haul hay up to the barn with it? You don't need the coloring. Both the word that God used and the color that the rope is indicates this is not a normal working rope. This isn't the kind of rope that you work with. It's a cosmetic rope. It's a rope that you decorate with. It's a rope that you look at. Let's kind of put this thing into sequence here. Let's see if we can figure something out. The Bible says that Joshua sent two men out to Jericho, this big city, this fortified city to spy out the land. It's going to be their first fight. He wanted to get a game plan. What's their strong points? What's their weak points? There's a problem with sending these two Jews into that very heathenistic Gentile city. They're only one generation removed from the land of Egypt. They still have Egyptian culture in them. They still speak with a very heavy Egyptian accent. These two Hebrews going into that extremely Gentile place are going to stick out like a sore thumb. If they talk too much, if they behave out of ordinary, somebody sooner or later is going to connect those two guys with that army that's just outside their walls. And they're going to say, those two guys are spies. And apparently that's exactly what happened. In our vernacular, we would say they got made. Somebody said, hey, these guys aren't one of us. They're some of those Hebrews. And somebody sent word to the king. The Bible says in verse number 3 that the king sent word to Rahab. Those two guys you got in your house, they're the Hebrews. They come to spy out the land. Wait a minute, how did he know what house they were in? There's a whole city. How did he know to send his guards to Rahab's house? They had been made. Somebody had spotted them. Somebody had sent word to the king. These two guys were being watched. Well, now you got a problem. As hard as this city is to get into, it's impregnable. It's got two high walls going around. Friend, as hard as it is to get in, man, it's that much harder to get out once you're on the inside. Once they start putting guards at every gate, or maybe even closing the gates, these two men now, they can't get out. they got to find some place to hide. What are they going to do? Archaeology teaches us, archaeologists teaches us, that the city of Jericho, well fortified, was only about six acres inside that top wall. That's not much land. Matter of fact, our church property down here is about six acres. So about the same as our churchyard right here was how much land was inside it. They estimate somewhere around 1,500 people lived inside those walls. That's not very big. It's hard for two guys to hide among 1,500 folks. They've got to find a place where men come and go all the time. Can you think of anybody's house where men might be coming and going all the time? Well, there's one occupation where men come and go all times of the day, all times of the night. It's the harlot's house. Question, how did these two guys who've never been in Jericho, never been there, they came out of Egypt, how did they know whose house the harlot's house was? I think it was because the harlot marked her house with a red thread, a scarlet rope. You say, preacher, that's just conjecture. You're right, it is. But even to this date, even today, if there's a neighborhood where a lot of ladies are that participate in this kind of work, we always refer to it as what? The red light district. Why? Because that color has always been associated with that occupation. This was not a work rope. This woman had in her house some way, a way to let folks know what her occupation was. Perhaps it was this scarlet 
thread. Perhaps that's how they knew whose house to go into. The Bible says once she needed a rope, she took this cosmetic rope down. It wasn't a real thread, but it was a cosmetic rope. She cast it over the wall and she let those two guys skimmy down her scarlet thread. Got to say one more thing about the color. You and I, we read the whole Bible, so we know more than just Joshua chapter 2. The color red's not just the color of that thread. It's also the color of blood. Scarlet, crimson. It means a red, a dark red, something like what our pews and our floor is here. It's a crimson color, a scarlet color. Color both of the rope, color, color of the blood. It's interesting. Our lives are stained like Rahab's life was stained with sin. Sin, scarlet, sin, crimson, sin, the color of red. But you take scarlet sin and you take the blood of Jesus Christ, which is also scarlet, crimson, and you pour on that scarlet life, that red sinful life, and you know what color it makes it? Red on red, crimson on crimson. It doesn't make it crimson. It makes it white. White is the purest snow. That's the beautiful thing about the blood of Jesus Christ. You can take the red of His blood, pour it on the red sins of your life, and it will make your life white <laughs> as snow. I don't know what happened to that rope that Rahab had that she let... The spies down. The Bible's going to tell us she's going to take it and tie it outside that window. It would become a mark. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's the third word that's used. I don't know whether she kept that red rope or not. The walls are going to come falling down. Every wall but her wall. Her house will stay intact. Her wall will stay intact. I don't know whether she'll ever think to reach out that back window and pull that scarlet rope in and keep it or not. But I'm going to tell you something. If she did, if she kept that scarlet rope the rest of her life, it's going to change meanings to her. You see, the beautiful thing about salvation is it really doesn't remove all the scars. The things that we've done wrong, they're still there. It doesn't even remove all the sorrows or the regrets. We still regret who we were and what we did before. But the thing about salvation is it gives new meaning to that old scarred, scarlet thread. Now we look at it and instead of just seeing our failures and our regrets, we look at it and we see what the blood of Jesus Christ has done to change our life. That scarlet thread, I think, that he mentions in verse number 18 was a picture of her life. Her life was the life of the harlot, but she applied the blood of Jesus Christ. And if she took that rope with her from this day forward, it's going to mean something totally different. It's not going to mean what I was. It's going to mean what I am. I am one who's under the blood of Jesus Christ. Second time the word rope is used, it's referred to as a scarlet thread. Third time, last time that this rope is referred to is in verse number 21. There it's called a scarlet line. Again, we've got another Hebrew word. Three different references, three different Hebrew words. Again, we've got another word with multiple meanings. <laughs> Strange, this Hebrew language. Three different words all can mean rope, but they all also have totally different meanings. This word is used 34 times in our Bible. 34 times in our Bible. Translated, of course, into our language, but it's used, the Hebrew word, 34 times. Only twice is it ever used to refer to a rope. And both times are in Joshua chapter number 2. In verse number 18... And in verse number 21, the word line, L-I-N, is the Hebrew word. It means rope. The other 32 times, it's either translated hope or expectation. Hope or expectation. That's amazing to me. Here's a word for rope. It means a rope. I could say, go get me a rope. And I could use that Hebrew word, and I could point to a table that's got ropes on it. You know to go over there and pick one of those things up. It means line. It means cord. It means rope. But 32 times in our Bible, it also means hope or an expectation. 
Verse number 21 is where she's taking that rope and she's hanging it outside her back window. I kind of imagine my guess is that it was outside the front door. Somehow it was some decorative cord that told men passing by what her occupation was. But now she's up on the wall. She needs to get these men down off the wall. And she thinks, where's a rope? I don't have a rope. Oh, I do have a rope. And she goes and grabs this decorative cord. She pulls it down. She brings it to her back window. She lets these two men down. And the sign that has to stay outside that back window, if it comes down, it negates the oath. The sign is, you've got to leave this rope at the back window. Why? Did she leave the rope hanging at the back window? Because it meant hope. She had expectation that when God's people came in and God's power fell, that God would show her and her family mercy. That while everybody else might in that city perish, if they were inside that house, the house that was marked by the rope of hope, that God would show them mercy. I don't know whether archaeology can back up what the Bible says concerning the wall or not. I know they can back up that it fell. History tells us, archaeology tells us, that the wall did not fall inward as you would expect from a battering ram of an enemy fighting against it. They would knock it inside. No, the Bible tells us, archaeology tells us, the wall fell outward. It fell forward, not inward. Archaeology teaches us that. But I don't know if archaeology can tell us all but one part of this circular wall fell. But I'll tell you because the Bible says so. All but one part of that wall fell. And the one part that didn't fall was the part that had the rope of hope tied to it. The rest of it, like dominoes, collapsed to the inside so that the Israeli soldiers didn't have to knock it down. They just stepped across it. The wall itself probably destroyed most of Jericho's army. All they had to do was step inside and deal with those that were left but 45 feet up in the air, attached to the wall from the outside, every Jew could see that rope of hope attached to the wall. Rahab's hope was not disappointed. Her life was saved. Her family, everybody that was inside the walls of her house were saved. I've already mentioned, Matthew mentions her in the line of Jesus Christ. She not only was spared, but she got used by God in such a glorious way that to this day we still speak of Rahab. Unfortunately, we still use that moniker, Rahab the harlot, but what we ought to say is Rahab the used of God woman. That woman that God used. That rope, that scarlet line, that decoration that spoke of her sorrowful and destroyed life had a new meaning. A meaning of faith in God. A meaning of deliverance. A meaning of a life fulfilled. Now here's the strange thing about when you start to study the Bible, you see things. Like I see this. You and I can't do anything about what we have done so far. What you've lived, what you've been, what you've done so far, it's written. It can't be undone. It can't be rewritten. If that's the life you want to live, a life of sorrow and destruction, that's what you have lived, you can't fix that, you can't undo that. But from this moment forward, you can decide what kind of life you're going to live. Can't fix a single yesterday, but I can change every one of my tomorrows. I can do it the same way Rahab did. I can choose to quit serving my false gods to quit living my pagan life and to trust Jesus Christ, to let the blood of Jesus Christ take away my sins. I can't make you make a right decision. Wish I could. Parent growing up with kids figures out sooner or later, you can't make them do right. You can constrain some outward behaviors. 
You can't change the heart. God's got to do that. You've got to make the decision today. What kind of life do you want to live? A life of sorrow. A life of destruction. Or a life of hope. Expectation. Satisfaction. My prayer this morning is you'll choose Jesus Christ. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the people to preach too. I pray that your word would speak to hearts. God, my words stumble. I stammer. I don't say things well. But God, your word pierces. Pierces to the deepest part of our soul and heart. And I pray this morning your arrow has rung true. I pray, God, your sword has sunk deep. Help us to look at our lives this morning. If we've not accepted you, God, help us to do so. If we have, help us to live for you. God, accomplish great things in our life this morning, and we'll give you the praise. We ask it in Jesus' name.